You've asked me to describe the seven wonders of the world, or my seven wonders of the world, and for a naturalist, every new thing they look at always a wonder of the world. But if I was to be really truthful and really tell you what I think, the wonder of the world for me is a mountain above the snow line. And I think of all the mountains I know, the Jungfrau is the most beautiful. And the first time I saw a snow-covered mountain in the sunshine, I was overwhelmed. It was just, it was like a sort of road to Damascus, really. It was so super. And I decided there, there and then that I must live in the mountains. And I built myself a chalet with a full view of the Jungfrau mountain. And I spent 30 winters there. is different in the mountains. It's very extraordinary to describe that, but it's much slower. You know, when you're a child, time seems to be endless, and you spend the whole morning knocking about, and lunch doesn't come, and all the rest of it. And it's like Christmas when you're a child that comes such long intervals, once a year. Now, when you're old, of course, Christmas comes all the time. But in the mountains, there's very different sense of time. And I adored going up early morning to see the dawn on the Jungfrau. It, you see, those were the days before one had helicopters or flights over mountains, and so it was a very unique sight. And you walked up and you listened, and just as the sun came up, just, well, it, it wasn't the sun coming, but as the light came up behind the mountain, you heard the snow finches in the rocks singing, and they were like hundreds of little bells tinkling. It was absolute magic. One of the... Uh, great bits of good fortune that I had was that when I came back into zoology after having left it for two years was to be living a train at least for six months a year. There I had my Uncle Walter's fabulous museum. In those days there was no television, no radio or anything. And the museum was absolutely an eye-opener to you. And it didn't matter what group of animals you were thinking about or discussing or studying, you saw the whole of the animal kingdom unfold before your eyes. I want to tell you the life cycle of this extraordinary worm which lives under the tongues of frogs. It's a funny place to live, peacefully under the tongue of this lovely animal we've got here. Gradually, it assumes the colour of the roof of the, of the frog's mouth so that it sort of disappears there. And there it sits and lays eggs. It's a hermaphrodite and it lays fertilised eggs. And they, they go down the intestine and out at the other end of the frog into the water. And there they hatch into, well, under the microscope, they look rather like a tennis ball with very long hair all over it. And this hair, beautiful waves of contraction go through this hair and they swim about. And finally, they come across one of these snails. It's a, it's a ram's horn snail, tiny little thing as you see. And these tennis balls penetrate into these snails. They've got little beaks and they penetrate. And there they develop into a sort of bag. And they bud off thousands of free swimming worms that of course are carry feeding on the liver of the snail. I think the snail feels pretty cheap. But anyway, that's another story. When these little um, 
worms have got to a certain size, they leave the snail. And then they, they lie on the bottom, or near the bottom of the pond, and an incredible thing happens. They withdraw into their own tails. A very famous uh, helminthologist called Wendell Cruel, he worked out this life cycle. It's an incredible performance. And the tails then grow things that look like little flowers or little ferns, which wiggle about in the water and attract the attention of a water flea. In Latin, it's called a cyclops. They come along, they look at these waving things, and then they try to eat the worm which is inside its own tail. And then the most amazing thing happens. The worm that in its own tail is shot out through a sort of hyaline tube which is folded up in the tail. And this shoots the worm like a pistol into the mouth of the cyclops and through into the intestine and then out of that into the body cavity. And when it gets to a certain stage of development, Along comes a dragonfly larvae, and they have a fine meal of the cyclops of the water flea. And then the trematode worm curls up inside them, and there it remains quietly. If these turn into a dragonfly, they still are infective, and the frog then catches the dragonfly or else the frog eats it before it gets to that stage. The moment it's inside the frog, it pops out of its cyst, this worm, and crawls up the gut in the opposite direction until it finds the tongue of the frog and then it settles down. It's an astonishing life cycle, really, because it's like di four different lives with four hosts. And the difficulty of finding those hosts, the complications of being shot out of one's own tail. I mean, it's incredible, really. It's an incredible feat. And it's so complicated and so weird. It really stretches your imagination to such an extent you can't believe in a Darwinian solution to this. You must really think there's a humorous god somewhere who's arranged the whole thing just for his amusement. The whole of nature is so marvellous. And then suddenly you stop and you think, yes, but the man-made things are marvellous too. And I then suddenly remember the day when I was walking across the sand in Israel and there was a sandstorm which blew up over the hills. And I had a camera with me and I was just about to take it and then suddenly there before me was this incredible a sort of frieze of golden buildings and there beneath the sandstorm was Jerusalem. <laughs> The real wonder of the world is really this carotenoids, this yellow pigment, which allows us to see at all. The visual pigment is derived from carotenoids, and it's common to the whole animal kingdom. We all depend on it. And when God said, let there be light, he was really saying, as far as we were concerned, let there be carotenoids, because we can't see the light without the carotenoids. There would be no light. The interesting point is that we can't synthesize carotenoids. We depend entirely on getting them from plants. But plants are very generous and they produce hundreds of tons of carotenoids over the world and so they have access to them. But without eating plants or animals which have eaten plants, we would never see a thing. I mean, we'd be as blind as bats. Well, much blinder than bats. And one of the things that's nice about carotenoids is that they're so beautiful. I mean, goldfinches, you see, 
That's carotenoids. Both the red and the yellow in goldfinches come from carotenoids. And the oranges and lemons, and so many of the very beautiful flowers. The daffodils, buttercups, the canaries, the goldfish, pollen, ripening corn and autumn leaves. All these things, they depend entirely on these marvelous pigments. I would always advise people who are at all interested in natural history to go on with it. I really believe that an interest in natural history and green things is a secret of a happy life. It's always interesting and you can't live long enough.